In this video, we're going to deploy the official Cisco virtual DNA center. This is going to end up being an OVA installation, and I'm going to do it inside of my single server 10.1.0.116, which is going to be the server that I'm using for my single box lab environment. As you can see, I have my identity services engine at 3.1. I have my EVE Pro installation, which is housing all of my lab equipment with regard to my routing and switching, my V-edges, my virtual Catalyst 9Ks. I have turned off my old DNA center. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new OVA, which is going to represent the DNAC SW237, which is the virtual DNA center. Now, we'll go ahead and we're going to give it a name. We'll just call it VDNAC-237. We'll hit next. We're going to deploy it on that server that I described. I'm going to make certain that everything is going to be thin provisioned. And I'm going to connect my interfaces to port group of DNAC port group, DNAC port group. I'm going to hit next and I'm going to hit finish. And then this is going to instantiate this image in the background. This is going to take a considerable amount of time. So what we're going to do is we're just going to edit out the weight in post-production. We can see that the process has completed, and we can see that we have the DNA C in our inventory. Now, before I do anything else, I am going to edit this because there's going to be some changes I want to make. I'm going to add two additional network cards. So I'm going to go ahead and add a network adapter and a fourth network adapter. I'm going to go ahead and change the others to VM network. Let's see, we can see that this virtual machine is going to use 32 virtual CPUs, which is substantially less than the VEDGE, which is traditionally less than the DNA center that I've been using, requiring a minimum of 64, so it's half. 256 gigs of RAM seems to be the sweet spot. I've played around with both of these. I would not recommend you guys do uh, much alteration here, if any. We can see that we have a 100 gig drive, a 550 gig drive, and a two terabyte drive. I do want to specify here that I did then provision all of these drives based on my configuration and my build, and this should be sufficient to getting the device configured. So now all I want to do is I'm going to right click and I'm going to power this device up. Once it powers up, we will be presented with the configuration wizard, which is going to be different yet similar to the normal DNA center deployment. I'm going to go ahead and open my console to this device and we will let it go through its installation. Again, I'll accelerate all of this in post. We see here the fact that we're being presented with the configuration wizard. Now, if I were to apply an IP address, gateway, and mask here, what I would be doing is I would be agreeing to utilize a graphical user environment to do my configuration. So whatever IP address I would set here, then I would use a browser to browse to it, and then I would then make my configuration inside of that installation tool. I'm going to select Skip, and then it's going to move me into the actual boot wizard. And I want to be very careful with regard to what we do here, because right now we can see it says create MKS, but you saw it immediately went down to create MKS non-seed. So it's important to kind of give this a, a little bit of time to stabilize. I'm going to hit the up arrow one time, and that should move it back up to create MKS. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and press enter, and it will walk me through the configuration wizard from this point forward. Start using MKS pre-manufactured cluster is what I'm going to select or the advanced configuration. So noticing the difference between the two, we can see clearly here in the blue text when we have the pre-manufactured cluster, it says the node will enable you to stand up the MKS node in its default manufactured state. This node supports bringing up MKS only in IPv4 mode. Use advanced mode for deploying MKS. 
And we see here, start the configuration of MKS in advanced mode, reading the blue text. Again, this mode will reset all default configuration of the MKS node and let you configure it from scratch. Once you use the advanced mode, you cannot go back to using default. I'm going to select advanced mode. I'm now going to navigate to proceed. Now we can see that we're being presented with something that's more akin to what we're accustomed to. I'm just going to configure IPv4 and hit next. I'm going to hit next because I'm just going to take all the layer two node defaults. I'm going to configure my enterprise interface. The enterprise interface is going to be the interface out of the four that we created that is going to be pointing towards the devices that the DNA center is going to control. This is going to require an IP address of 100.64.0.201 in my lab with a slash 24 subnet mask. I am going to go ahead and point my gateway of last resort just to 100.64.01, and I am going to designate this as my cluster link. I'm taking the path of least resistance when it comes to establishing configuration on this device. I shall select next, and I'm going to go ahead and bypass the configuration of a cluster interface because in my lab environment, I'm not going to run a cluster. Next, we have the management IP address. This interface is going to be on my management side of my network, which is going to correspond to the network that all of my production devices are working on. This is going to be 10.1.255.201, and my internal network is a slash 16 environment. I am not going to specify a gateway of last resort in this instance, since I've already specified a gateway of last resort on the enterprise side. And then I'm not going to need any type of specialized static routes. And obviously, we've already configured a cluster link, so this is now not an option. The fourth interface would be for internet access. I could have dedicated ethernet connectivity on this device to allow it to be able to communicate directly to Cisco's update servers, PNP, whatever connect tools or resources that we have. But again, I am not going to utilize this, so I'm just simply going to go to next. And now it's going to ask me to configure my DNS server. I will use Google's 8.8.8. .8 and we'll just leave it at that minimum. Selecting next, I'm going to move through the config and I'm going to tell it that I want it to proceed. So I will select enter and it's going to handle the configuration. But first it needs to validate whether or not the networking configurations that I applied are indeed operational. So it's going to try to communicate to, to the DNS server, which remember we specified as 8.8.8.8. .8 you can see that it was successfully able to connect to that, des that destination, and now it's going to ask us to configure the cluster details. This is an option, so I'm going to simply bypass it. And now I'm going to establish the password that I'm going to use for my device. Repeat that password. and then hit next. It's going to ask me to identify the NTP server I want to use because time is very important in DNA Center. So I'm going to utilize time.google.com and hit next. We're not gonna worry about NTP authentication. Now it's going to attempt to validate reachability to time.google.com. And lastly, it's going to let me establish the subnet ranges that I'm going to utilize for all of the Docker containers that are going to provide support capabilities inside of my environment. In fact, it's going to present us with default options in the 169.254 range. And I'm going to go ahead and accept those because I'm not running those internal in my network anywhere. And I'm going to select next. We can see here that it's going to give me a warning that this is going to actually um, affect any provision disks that are on this device, but it's a scratch start, so I'm not going to worry about it. Ergo, I'm going to navigate to proceed and select enter. The system will configure NTP, and then it will begin to do everything that it needs to do to update and configure itself as a functional DNA center. This is going to take a considerable amount of time. I am going to let this get to a certain point, and then once it reaches that point, what I will do is I will pause the video, and I will restart the video once all of our services have been mounted and the system is accessible from the graphical user environment.
either from the enterprise side, 100.64.0.0 slash 24, or from the management side, which will fall in the 10.1.0.0 slash 16 network range. We can see now that the system has mounted both of the IP addresses that I specified, 100.64.0.201 and 10.1.255.201. And the wizard is going to shut down dynamically, or I can go ahead and choose to close the wizard. And what's going to end up happening now is the device is going to reload. This time we can clearly see that the process is ongoing. It's been almost an hour. I'm going to navigate over to my browser and I'm going to see if I can browse to HTTPS 10.1.255.201. Hit enter and let's see if it lets us log in. We can see it's presenting with the login ID. Now this is where the virtual DNA center, the official virtual DNA center is going to be different than any of the DNA centers we work with before. This device is actually going to have a default administrator account with a default password. We will, once we log in, be tasked to create our own user account and assign it a password. So that's a deviation from what we're accustomed to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and click login, and I'm going to log in using admin. And the password here is going to be M-A-G-L-E-V one at three. So if I take a look at the password here, you can see it's maglev one and the at symbol and three. And this should let us log into this device. And as you can see, it's going to task us to create a new user because the admin account is a temporary username and password. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and provide this information, Terry Vinson. I'm going to be a super admin user my password or my username will be T Vinson. I'm not going to provide my email, but I do need to provide a password and I'm going to use our ice is cool password. I want to make sure I didn't fat finger that. So ice is cool. We'll do the same thing here. Ice is cool. We'll hit submit. And what this is going to do is it should create a new user for us and bump us back out of the login. We'll log in one more time. This time I'll use T Vinson. And the password will be ice is cool. And let's see if it lets us log in. About an additional 30 minutes have passed. And we now see in the top right hand corner a little cloud. That cloud has a check mark on it. I intend to select that. And what we want to do is we want to navigate to software management software deployment. And what I want to look at is there's an option here that says currently installed applications. And what we're going to see is some of these applications, as an example, like the DNA CAAP, the B2B upgrade, any of the identity services, plugin modules, and everything are all pending deployment. This is what I wanted to demonstrate with regard to the platform. And as a direct result of us being able to see that, now what we're going to do is we're going to stop the video right here, and I'm going to pick up the video once the installation has been completed successfully, and we're going to take a look at the user interface that we've been presented by Cisco in this phenomenal utility, this fantastic tool that they're giving us. It's also important to understand that this software is going to be, according to everything that I've been told, available for general release in the month of July. That is also going to be counterpointed by Cisco's promise that this software is not going to cost anything. The direct intent is, is that if you want to use it in production, obviously you're going to have to license the devices and resources, which means you're going to need to have some type of DNA Essentials, DNA Advantage, or DMA, DNA Premier License. It's also important to note that if you want tax support, they will actually sell tax support on a per-instance basis for each of these OBA-driven VMs. So I'm waiting to hear more and more about this, but from my perspective, when it comes to utilizing a tool like this to be able to study by building a home lab for the purposes of CCIE or to learn more about the way DNA Center works by building your own sandbox, the optimum amount of benefit is going to be achieved in having a much, much smaller, lighter lift as it relates to a DNA center in your lab environment, whether it be a home or whether it be at work.
So I'm hoping this was helpful, and I hope you guys are excited to see the next video, and I'll see you guys in that one.